Well, good morning. morning. I'm so glad you made it. It's good to be here today, and I'm glad that you're able to be with us. Um, Last week, Melissa and I were on vacation. We were flying back in from Fort Myers. When we went to the airport, it was 65 degrees at 5.30 in the morning. And when we were flying over uh, this area, we were, the pilot brought us in on 70, like following I-70, and we were able to see all of Hilliard from our vantage point. And I'm following the landmarks, and I, I get to Life Point, and I notice under this blanket of white how clear our parking lot was compared to everybody else's. I'm elbow Melissa, I'm like, check it out, that's so good. As soon as we land, I text Brad Mazaris, who oversees all that, uh, man, you're a rock star and all that jazz. And then, and, and so I just want to give a huge shout out in months like this to guys like Brad and TJ and Roger Dickinson and Ted who were shoveling the driveway and shoveling the walks and salting it. And our parking team, I don't, I, if I tried to name everybody, I'd miss it. But I just want to tell you, this place is run by incredible ministry partners who honor God and serve the family at the same time through their gifts. So thank you to everybody that makes this place what it is. It's a beautiful place to be a part of, and, and you make it that. You really do. How about Bailey last week? He, he preached his first sermon. Easy, easy on the woo-hoos. Easy. Temper your enthusiasm. Few things I need to correct. One, I don't loathe Christmas. I didn't assault the Christmas tree, although I was maybe a little frustrated at the break-in. And, hey, look, so we were teaching on Wednesday night, and evidently he mentioned his love for Sour Patch Kids. And as soon as he, he, we get there Wednesday night, one of the folks in, it, that had been in service throws him his huge bag of Sour Patch Kids. So I'd just like to say, I think Harley Davidson's will be in heaven. <laughs> and uh, a road king, I mean, who doesn't want one, right? I'll, I'll be here Wednesday just waiting around. <laughs> I'm so I'm grateful for Bailey. He's a, he, we, we don't just work together and, and minister together. He's a friend of my heart, and uh, he gives me such great hope for the generation that's following our generation, uh, guys like him and Sarah, folks like that, uh, those families. If you brought your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 4. It's not traditionally a, a Christmas passage of Scripture, but as you're turning there... Um, How many of you would say, you know, there's a situation in my life that I need to invite Jesus into? How many of you would say, there there is, there's a situation? Good news is you're not alone. Good news is people have been finding themselves in situations just like that for a long, long time. And we're going to dive into this passage this morning and just, it, it may be a familiar passage to many of you. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35, it says, That day, when evening came, that day Jesus had been teaching by the the Sea of Galilee, or the Lake of Galilee, as some refer to it. He'd been teaching in in parables, short stories with a point about about the truth of God. He'd been teaching in unconventional places, because you see, the conventional places began to close their doors to Jesus. The synagogues were no longer as welcoming to Jesus. As Jesus was calling out its leaders over and over, the doors became closed. And so Jesus, in unconventional ways, went to where the people were and began to approach them at a level that they were hungry for. That day was a day that Jesus was finishing teaching the parable of the sower and different things had been, had been taught by the, by the sea that day. And When evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. The other side is where the garrisons were at. So he's he's now ready. The, The preaching, the teaching has stopped, and he's ready to go to the other side, leaving the crowd on one side and him going to another. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Would you say furious? Furious. We often read this like, a furious squall came up. And the way, I mean, this is desperate. Have you ever been on a boat in a big big body of water 
and there's a storm, it's terrifying. It's really overwhelming. I grew up not far from Lake Erie. I didn't spend a ton of time there, but I, I could recall probably I was on the on the lake probably a dozen times as a little kid fishing with, with my dad and, and, and different friends of the family. And, and Lake Erie, like the Sea of Galilee, is, is somewhat notorious for, for pop-up storms, right? Storms that pop up and the waves get, get rough. And, and that is exactly what was happening. A storm that they couldn't predict showed up. Have you ever been in your life when a storm that you couldn't predict showed up and you didn't know what to do next? That's where they are. Now, what's really interesting about where they are and who they are, these are fishermen by trade. A lot of the disciples, their life and their livelihood before being introduced to Jesus, they fed their family by fishing. So they spent a lot of time on the water. They owned boats themselves. Peter, we know, owned several boats. So a furious squall came up or a storm began to rage so much so that it was breaking over the boat. It's filling the boat with water, right? The waves are, the breakers are coming over and it's swamped. Jesus was in the stern, that's the back end of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. Did anybody ever have a water bed? <laughs> right? Anybody still have a water bed? Because <laughs> you're super cool if you do, man. Those are a thing of the past, right? Jesus is sleeping on this unbaffled waterbed-like scenario while getting wet. The disciples are freaking out. They're not enjoying any of this. Matter of fact, we read in the next phrase, right? It says, the disciples woke him up and said to him, um, pardon me, teacher. Um, I don't know if you're aware. You're all wet now. We're taking on water. You might want to wake up. No, they wake him up, and they, they wake him up with an urgent accusation. Don't you care if we drown? How, how do, what, would you love to be woke up like that? <laughs> right? It's, a, it's an accusation like you don't even care about us. It's like a four-year-old going to a mother, a toddler who ran out of fruit roll-ups, going, don't you love me? Where are the fruit roll-ups? Right? No? I mean, it, it seems like maybe a little overboard or maybe it seems like the situation in their mind was overwhelmingly urgent and they wake him up and they they start saying we're gonna we're gonna drown this is over this is gonna overtake us I love what verse 39 says he got up he got up let that sink in for a minute he got up He got up. I could just quit preaching right now. He got up. Jesus got up. He got up on the third day after a crucifixion and left a tomb empty. He got up in a boat. He got up. Not only did he get up then, he, he rises to the occasion now. He shows up in our storm. He arrives in the moment. He takes authority over the, over the stuff. He got up. He got up. He rebuked the wind, and said to the waves. <laughs> he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, quiet. The word quiet in the Greek is sapao, and it's the same root from which we get the word peace or we get the word silent. In the King James, in the English Standard Version, I believe it's in the New American Standard Version, it says, peace, be still. Peace, be still. He got up and he rebukes the wind and he says to the waves, Peace, be still. Mm. I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know what you might be going through in life. But I would say this to you. Jesus can still speak peace over the complexity of your storm because the truth is this peace may not be our condition peace may not be our condition but it's always a person and his name's Jesus and he has been peace since since the beginning of time 
John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. He was with God in the beginning. He was God. He's the essence of God. He is our peace. He is what the Jewish people call our shalom. He's our peace. Now, you know why Jesus can command peace? Because it's the essence of who He is. My peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Peace. Peace. Wonderful peace. Maybe you're here today and maybe, maybe Christmas hasn't, hasn't conjured up great thoughts for you this year. Maybe Christmas isn't, isn't as joyous as you would like it be, to be and, and perhaps you need to know that Jesus can still stand up from the cushion in the back of your life's boat and begin to walk toward the bow in the front and outstretch his arms and rebuke the wind and say to the waves, peace. <laughs> peace. Peace. Be still. The angels in Luke chapter 2, verse 14 came to bring great tidings of great joy. I love it when Linus in Peanuts begins to quote this passage of Scripture. It's beautiful, isn't it? And it was that passage of Scripture that we will uh, pause and think about today for just a moment as we as we reflect on the words and the complexity of the writer of our carol or our hymn for today was reflecting on those words. Because peace wasn't his condition. Peace on earth and goodwill to men on whom God's favor rests, he didn't feel like qualified for him. Maybe you're here, maybe you feel that way. Our nation is feeling that way. It doesn't feel like a peaceful nation much these days. I don't want to digress and, and go too far, but it is interesting how far we have seemed to come in not being a nation of peace. The author of the, of the poem-turned-classic, iconic Christmas carol felt the same in his day. The poem was written on Christmas Day in 1864. A lot of events were happening. The Civil War was raging. It would be four months and a few days later that, that General Grant would surrender to General Lee at, in Virginia and, and the Civil War would effectively find its closure. He was... In the midst of a lot of strife nationally, his son, in 1863, joined the Army of the Potomac and suffered a musket wound that went under his shoulder blade and clipped a piece of his spinal cord. It didn't kill him. Charles was his name. He was a lieutenant in the Army of the Potomac, fighting for the Union side. But peace wasn't what the author felt in those moments. His wife in 1861, soon after the beginning of the Civil War, was uh, found tragedy striking her life, ultimately taking her life. Peace wasn't his condition. The poem is called Christmas Bells. Its author is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Longfellow was no stranger to difficulty and adversity in his life. His first wife died giving during childbirth, and so did the child. His second wife, Frances Appleton, um, from a prestigious family who scorned his advances for quite a number of years, and then finally, you know, his unrelenting uh, affection and persistence, guys, paid off, and she said yes. They had six children, five of which... Uh, lived, one died in early childhood. Their girls um, all had longer hair, 
as it was the custom back then. They lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in a house that, that Henry's new father-in-law had bought them when they got married. I'd love to visit that, that area one day. I've never been to Cambridge, just across the river from Boston. So I want to read an excerpt from, from Fanny's journal on July 9th. It said this, we're all sighing from the good sea breeze, or I'm sorry, we're all sighing for the good sea breeze instead of this stifling land when filled with dust. It was a really sultry, hot, humid time uh, in July in Massachusetts that year. Poor Allegra is very droopy with heat, and Eddie has to get her hair in a net to free her neck from the weight. That was on July 9th. On July 10th, Fanny, like any good mother wanting to care for her daughter's struggle during the summer, decided to clip her hair and relieve some of that weight. Having doing, done so, she was putting some of the curls in an envelope, and she was going to seal the envelope with sealing wax. That's long before the Lickett envelope which now we've advanced, praise the Lord, to the peel off that thing and put it down. So she got the sealing wax out, and they have all the windows open in their, in their house that was right on the river, hoping to catch any kind of breeze. This is long before air conditioning. And as she was melting the wax, either an ember or a piece of hot wax fell on her cotton dress, and the wind came in, and it engulfed her in flames. In a desire to save the children from the flame, she ran to Henry's library, and he began to try to smother out the fire with a, with a small rug. And he began, when that wasn't doing it, he wrapped his body around her, desperately trying to extinguish the flames before the flames would do any more damage. On July 10th, or I'm sorry, on July 11th, she died from her injuries. Henry grew a beard. He's known for his beard. Every picture you probably have seen of him, he's wearing a beard. The reason he wear, wears that beard is because of the injuries he sustained trying to save his wife's life. And then he began to go through his own journey of difficulty. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow also wrote what we, many of you have heard quoted many times, I'm sure, into every life a little rain must fall during his grieving. In 1861 on, on Christmas Day, now remember this is an author, he's the first American author ever to be able to sustain his life from his work. He retired from Harvard and was able to continue on by making a living writing. First person in American history to be able to do so. He sold one poem that set a record for $3,000, first person to do so. He wrote Paul Revere's Ride and Evangeline. Anyway, I'm boring you. Here's the point. Christmas Day, 1861, this is the entry in his journal. How inexpressibly sad are the holidays. Maybe some of you have felt that way. July 10, 1862, on the anniversary of, of his wife's death, he wrote this, I can make no record of these days, better that I leave them wrapped in silence. Perhaps someday God will give me peace. December 25, 1862, now that he is both father and mother to his, his children, trying to provide for them, trying to be what they need him to be, he put up a Christmas tree and he said, the Christmas tree was pretty, but this is the excerpt that, that struck me. A Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is no more for me. December 25th, 1863, soon after his son Charles had been wounded and he had received word of his wounding in the, in the war, there was absolutely no journal entry on Christmas Day. It, it speaks a bit to where he was at emotionally. It speaks a bit to the storm in his own life. It speaks a, it speaks a bit to the rocking of his own boat, the difficulty of the own waves, the coming in of the water into life uninvited. It's like rearranging the furniture without permission. Right? And then on 1864, December 25th, 
reflecting on the words of Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. He wrote these words. It began as a poem with seven stanzas. Two of the stanzas have been removed because they were in direct correlation to the Civil War. In the poem that he wrote called Christmas Bells, we call I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day the same hymn. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along through a broken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then chapter, or verse stanza four, I, I dearly love it. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I have a collection of old hymnals. There's a lot of great truth, a lot of great theology and hymnology, a lot of deep meaning behind the words that many of us grew up singing that we rarely realize where it came from. What I love about this particular, it, it seems to be one of, you know, stanza three is one of the saddest lines in any Christmas song you would ever sing. But what I dearly love about this song is we get to watch the struggling to break through. We get to watch Jesus getting up from the stern of the boat and walking toward the bow, rebuking the wind and speaking peace over the waves. We get to watch somebody going through their human struggle arrive at the place that God is never absent even though life is hard, He is still good. He is not asleep. <laughs> you know, when I reflect on, on the story, the narrative of Mark chapter 4 on the sea, when I reflect on the, on, on the simplicity and the complexity of the story. The simplicity is, is that God is always there. God's with you when it's hard. God is with you when it's hard. If you're going through something hard, I want to say to you, God is with you when it's hard. So often we're tempted to believe that because life is hard that God is absent. Or because things are bad, that God's not good. Or that somehow the circumstances I'm in negate the glory of God. Or they've changed the character attributes of God. As if God's character is somehow dependent on my circumstance. Has anybody ever been tempted to believe that? Because see, our feelings lie to us. Our feelings lie to us all the time. One of the most dangerous things that's happened in recent history, by recent I mean the last 50 years, was the lie that if it feels good, do it. The lie that was birthed out of the Woodstock generation, if it feels good, do it. Well, that means you should only trust your feelings to somehow arrive at an empty platitude of happiness. I digress. What I, what I truly love about this is we're, re right, we're, we're breaking into a journal entry and we watch somebody's pain. And when you begin to understand the backstory and you begin to understand the pain that brought the process and the process that brought the, the, the breakthrough yet again. And Longfellow went on to write some of his greatest works after he was, lost his wife, Fanny. He went on to continue to thrive because, see, there was a deep connection between his heart and God's truth. 
from that time forward. What I love about Mark chapter 4 is Nathan and I were, were talking about it. It's so good to have our son home. Um, is that it does embody the message of Christmas. It embodies the essence of Emmanuel. It embodies the true essence of all things that Christmas came to deliver is that God is with us. God is present. God is active. God can be counted on. And the, the simplicity and the truth is that God is present. The complexity is he didn't get up until he was asked. He remained on a cushion in a chaotic waterbed with a super soaker going on until requested in that moment. I think there's a lot we can extrapolate from that. One is God knew it would be okay. Because Jesus understood the boat's not going down with him in it. <laughs> so he could sleep through anything. <laughs> they just hadn't caught on to that truth yet. Right? But I also think there's an image there that we can profit from. Not to do injustice to the text or add anything to it, but I think there's a powerful truth that when he was disturbed, even though he knew it would be all right, he moved. He got up. He responded. Isn't that good? I hope when you hear the carol or hymn, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, that it will have more deep and hollowed meaning for you. I hope that you'll, you'll resonate and understand that most of these truths were born out of somebody's pain and breakthrough. And maybe you're at the place where, where you're in the pain and you need the breakthrough and, and Jesus is still the same as he was in 1864. As he was in a little rickety fishing boat going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, he's still the same. Jesus is the deliverer of peace. He's the one who brings peace. He gives it because he embodies it. It's an attribute of who he is. Right? Peace may not be your circumstance. It may not be your condition. But it's always a person. He was trying to help his disciples understand that in the upper room. He was trying to help them wrap their minds around the truth of who he was and his mission to accomplish and, and their commission to, to live. And, and he was constantly constantly teaching the disciples every, every opportunity he had, not only about the, the deep truths of God, but also about his mission on earth. And the closer he came to the cross, knowing the time was at its full measure, he was, he was moving to try to focus the eyes of the disciples on what was about to happen. Have you ever taken your kids on a roller coaster and you're trying to explain it to them so that, th that you, you know what they're about to experience, right? It's, it's, it's sort of, I know that's a horrible analogy, but, but he's trying to help them see it so they're not as fearful, so they can, they can have context of what's about to take place. He gathers them in the upper room to celebrate a Passover meal, a Passover Seder and he had celebrated Passover for, for 33 years. He grew up in a Jewish family. We believe he celebrated Passover with, with the disciples two, if not three years. And in that, in that moment, he takes what would be ordinary parts, accompaniments to the meal, 
to make a poignant word picture. One that they could grasp, one that they could understand, one they could hold on to when life gets hard. So he took the bread, which would have been baked without leaven, and it would probably would have had a texture that went after he gave thanks for it and broke it. It may have had the, you hear it sound, right? It's not like uh, Schwabel's white. He gave thanks for it, and he said, this is my body. It's broken. It's broken for you. In like measure, he took the, the wine and he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is a new covenant in my blood, which is spilled for you. As often as you do this. And I think he took a slow gaze around the room. And I think he made eye contact with his disciples. Remember me. Remember me. Remember me. Remember me. And as we draw into Christmas week, the week we mark to commemorate the incarnation, God creator becoming flesh created, we want to create a pause and say, let's remember him. If you're in a storm in your life, let's remember him. If you have occasion to be extraordinarily joyous in your circumstances at this time in your life, remember him. But at this time, we invite you to worship in remembrance at the Lord's table through communion. I believe the angels were right. There is peace on earth. When Jesus left, the Holy Spirit came. Peace on earth, favor, goodwill to men on whom his favor rests, right? Let's remember him, church. This table is for his disciples. You don't have to be a member of our church or a regular attender of our church. If you're visiting, thank you for being here. Uh, if you've embraced Jesus as your Savior, this table is for you. I, I caution you in the words of the Apostle Paul, no one should eat or drink from this table in an unworthy manner, for to do so, one eats or drinks judgment against themselves. What Paul is saying is, make sure this connection's good. Make sure these connections are right. Right? So we should examine ourselves before we come to the Lord's table. And that's one of the reasons that we have communion the way we have it here. We don't want to pass the trays and, and force somebody to make a microwave decision when God may be leading you to marinate in this moment and take a hard inventory. So I won't give you instructions on when to eat the bread or drink the juice. It's a moment of personal worship in a corporate body of believers. Okay? The, the night that Jesus was with the disciples, he didn't say, now everybody tear off a piece and hold on to it. We did that. We, we made this the tradition that it's become. So we create this pause in a sacred moment. That's what sacrament means, sacred moment. To, to allow us to lean in. The bread's gluten-free. We want to eliminate every obstacle so that we can have communion together. It's juice, not wine. We have a lot of people in recovery around here. So we're not going to be the place that gives you any reason to take a step backward. Amen? We're here to worship in spirit and in truth. We're here to lean in to the truth that Jesus is peace. That Jesus is present. That he still calms the wind and the waves. He can still set straight what's been going sideways. Whatever we're going through, let's invite him into it. Amen.